Our guest this episode is Lisa Reardon Seville. She describes herself as an independent reporter and producer focused on stories that explore how money, power, and policy shape the lives of everyday people across the United States. I would describe her as one of the most effective voices I see in journalism in humanizing the effects of mass incarceration. Along with Bliss Broyard, she captured the stories of the 15 people who died at Rikers Island last year in a New York Magazine cover story that graced the final cover of 2021. And her new film, Woman on the Outside, has just been accepted at the South by Southwest Film Festival that will take place in Austin later this year. I just want you to know, I'm going to try to keep it together, but I've been really kind of pulling over your stories and the work Aww. that you've done. And um, it's just so beautiful what you do and how you write. And I'm really wanting you to know how I appreciate the way that you handle the families. Um, it's a sacred honor when we give you guys the opportunity to really open up and that's not easy to do. And so when it comes back to you and it feels like what you would have said yourself, mm -hmm. then I know it's God sent and you are an angel and you are being used to do some really good work. And thank you so much for uh, sharing this with us today. And uh, I, I just personally really appreciate it. Well, thank you for saying that. I um, I know how much it takes for people to share some of these stories that I do. Uh, it, well, I should say I I can imagine. I don't know personally, and I think that that um, that lack of knowledge is what I try and respect and try and be respectful of people. The process of journalism is a little rough. You know, you, you do have to ask hard questions and it's important to give people the opportunity to answer the hard questions. So the hard questions might come at them at some point and better that folks know, but um, you're also asking people to dig into some of the hardest experiences of their lives uh, right. and, with them. and um, I, I, I recognize what I'm asking, I guess I should say. And I recognize what people are giving. For people who are not familiar with your work, a excellent precy of that work uh, and an incredibly moving piece of work that, that was published at the beginning of the year in New York Magazine is this account of uh, the 15 deaths in Rikers last year. And there are a lot of lines that I'd like to spend talking uh, to you about that we can draw through these lives, but wanted to start with the simplicity of the stories that she wrote. And simplicity is not meant to be a pejorative term, but my instinct when confronting deaths in jails was to find out what happened, what went wrong and who was accountable and missed almost all of the humanity. And the simplicity and the humanizing language that you used to describe these 15 lives, I found to be extraordinary. And for those who have not picked up the article, support good journalism, subscribe to New York Magazine, pay for good work, and read this. And um, tell us how it came together. So um, to give credit where credit is due, this was actually an assignment from New York Magazine. Um, they reached out to my co-writer, Bliss Royard, who has written for them before. And we um, actually sort of were connected in another way and she reached out to me because it was a big job, unfortunately. Um, they wanted to do sort of obituaries or profiles of everyone who had died. Um, and, you know, there were 13, I believe, when we got the assignment and 15 um, when it ended. So, you know, th that's a lot of lives to figure out. It's a lot of reporting. We did try and understand what happened. Um, both how they arrived at Rikers and how each of these men passed away. But we also wanted to understand who they were uh, before they arrived, um, you know, the, who loved them, what, what experiences had brought them there. And that was a real balance. Um, you know, there's always an interesting part of journalism when you're dealing with criminal justice because the facts of sort of how folks died or how they arrived in custody are relevant, but I never want them to be the whole story because they're not. Um, and so they're, you know, navigating that was 
was part of it. Um, but it really, we really depended on speaking to the people who knew them, understanding who this individual was, um, whether a son, a father, a partner, um, you know, the whole of them. And so that um, Bliss and I split them up, you know, we, we sort of each took some names and we started making calls. Um, there were a number of people who had, the local press had covered this over time. And so it's really important to give credit where credit is due there. There is so little local journalism now. Um, and without that, our job would have been really much harder. Um, and so New York, we still have newspapers. Um, in a lot of places, we don't. And so these these deaths go unreported entirely. Um, and someone might not even be counting who died in a jail in some part of New Jersey or some part of Louisiana or some part of Georgia. Um, but we, we started reaching out to the families and they were interested in talking. That's not always the case, as you two may know. Um, but people were really motivated. They felt like I heard over and over again that this had happened to their loved one and they didn't want it to happen again. Um, and so, you know, some people I talked to on the phone, it's still COVID. Some people I talked to on Zoom. Some people, it was that little lull where I could sit in their living room. Um, and and we could spend the time. Um, and that to me, if it's possible, is always really important because you are excavating really hard moments and to be able to be a person and sit with another person and talk about their loved one and their grief is important. Um, so Bliss and I uh, spent a few months doing that and then also trying to talk to sources in government, trying to speak to um, folks who had worked or did work at Rikers and really understand what are the forces behind these deaths? Because for the most part, the people did not die of COVID and they didn't die explicitly of violence in the jail. They died largely of lack of oversight, neglect, lack of medical care and conditions that were really harrowing that led to um, what we think is six people taking their lives. So suicides in a jail are a sign of dysfunction. They're not just a sign of one individual. I mean, obviously mental health plays a role, but when you're seeing that pattern, it means that something is going wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's, we needed to paint that without that overtaking the lives of the individuals. And that was a real um, part of it because I feel like I got to know a little bit of each of these men. Um, and sometimes it was their loved one talking about one of the hardest moments of their lives. And many times it was their loved one talking about why they loved this person, even if they were the victim of the election. Um, yeah, so that published in January, and it was really interesting to see, you know, how people responded to it. Yeah, I know in looking over, one of the things that stood out with me right in the beginning um, was the fact that you made the point of stating that Rikers is a series of jails, you know, not a prison. And, you know, we struggle with that here <clears throat> That perception that, oh, if you can't do the, t- the, cr- the time, don't do the crime. And, you know, and but we live in a country that, you know, prides itself on the legal system of innocent until proven guilty. Um, and so I think what you were able to bring out in, you know, highlighting that these are the humanness of the people that are here, but also um these are our citizens that are just being detained until they get their opportunity to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And how do we as a society justify the treatment of those people who haven't been, or even if they have been, um, but they are entrusted to our custody. And that's a, that's a sacred right. You know, so in speaking with those that worked in the facilities, what were some of your biggest takeaways from what they were saying 
um, about how, um, you know, whether it's staffing or administrative policies or whatever that contributed to a lot of, or did you get that idea that contributed to a lot of this, of the deaths that were there? You know, we didn't get too deep into this in the piece, but I think it's really important. Um, Rikers Island, or the New York City Department of Correction, has, as the federal monitor describes, one of the richest staff to detainee ratios in the country, which means there there are actually more staff members that right now than there are detainees. Um, it's a really strong union. They have advocated very well for their staff. Um, but there was what has largely been described as a staffing crisis. And that's in part because there is unlimited sick leave. The, the union is really strong and they kind of, the New York Times have covered, covered this really well. Like folks just wouldn't show up to work or they would, um, it's sort of how they allocated staff that was really the problem. There were a lot of people on, you know, the special kind of strike team, um, but not a lot of people on the floor. So you would have one officer in a housing unit, um, which is just not enough to respond to fights, to de-escalate, to respond if someone is having a medical emergency, to you need one person to stay in the housing unit, another person to escort someone if they have mm. a medical emergency. So um, for months during this crisis at Rikers, the federal monitor, there was a settlement some years ago after a lawsuit. Right. Kind of very well covered. And so a federal monitor has been overseeing the jail for I believe six years now. And usually they do two reports a year and they started writing these letters to the court saying this is the crisis but the the monitor really reiterated there are enough staff it's just where they're going that's mm -hmm. um and the the monitor had some pretty alarming things to say about the potential for cultural change um within the institution um, the problems with leadership, and I think mm -hmm. leadership at any institution like this really sets the tone. And on the other hand, you can change the person at the top, but it doesn't automatically change the rest of the institution, as we've seen. Um, mm -hmm. So that that is the overarching. But I also always want to emphasize, you know, two, two correction officers can have very different attitudes in the same space. One can be much more attentive. Um, a lot of correctional officers at Rikers come from the same community. They see people they know come through, you know, and that's true in most institutions that are at least proximate to where people grew up. Um, and then other and and other people get really jaded. It's hard. Mm -hmm. it is a, jails are not um, a place that foster humanity. <laughs> You know, it is a crisis place. People are scared. Um, you know, it, it's it's tense, and so uh, I think we need to kind of think about that when we think about um, these places. And you know, I talked. I had a couple conversations off the record with a number of people, and one person said something, and she said, in her time working within the system. Um, it wasn't a correctional officer, just for context, but she really said, I came to realize how problematic jails are because the very culture sort of requires you to get desensitized. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And how do you go to work every day and function while also keeping the empathy that you need to not ignore someone when they hmm. uh, attempt on their life? And just think that they're, you know, trying to get attention. So, those are the very deep structural things that we saw, and and not all of that explicitly made it into the story, but it really kept me thinking about the nature of institutions like this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, the 
the similarities were stark, right? I mean, they were all men, they were all black and brown. Uh, I think there are a few exceptions here, but they were largely nonviolent. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, I think people who support prison reform would say most of them did not belong in pretrial detention. They belonged mm -hmm. in drug treatment or they belonged in mental health intervention or they belonged in some kind of diversion. And when you're familiar, if you're not familiar with this work and you read this article, it, it is also an outline of all the ways the system has failed us across the yes. country in every mm -hmm. jail from from Rikers to, you know, San Ysidro. Right. Um, but um, there there. What struck me was all of the different ways you can end up in Rikers where the system has also failed us, whether it's driving while while black or, um, you know, uh, petty sort of parole violations that don't even involve criminal behavior. Um, and then, of course, when you get there, all the ways that Rikers, you know, can fail you, whether it's neglect or whether it's uh, we don't want to call our captain after hours or mm -hmm. um, I don't believe you're sick um, to then all of the ways that it failed to preserve life when something really bad happened. Were there any in there that um, were unexpected um, that, that came to light only when you put the 15 stories together? Um, Similarities or differences? This is the one that I struggled or the two that I struggled with the most. Um, and we didn't go that deep, but I want to bring it up. Um, we got back from the medical examiner that two people died of methadone overdoses. Um, Rikers has a really progressive opioid substance abuse treatment program where they provide methadone and suboxone in the jails. Um, all the research shows this saves lives. Um, because one of the most dangerous things is when people get out of jail and if they use again, that's like when you're really prone to overdose. And so they've trained visitors in using naloxone and, and different opioid reversals and, and it really is an important program. Um, I think it speaks to the dysfunction of the jail that people were either not getting the right dosage um, because methadone can be dangerous, it's like any other drug, or, or it was getting diverted somehow and people were using it. And, you know, I, I think, I think it speaks to the ways in which these institutions are doing really important work that's beyond the scope of what a jail traditionally should do, which is like providing access to really necessary drug treatment. And as we've seen during the pandemic, so many people have died. Um, and I, as I was reporting it, I, I was trying to figure out, and I talked to a lot of people, like this is, this is a sensitive thing and we don't know the answers. We don't know how they got it. We don't know, you know, we only know. And it's also actually quite hard to tell that someone OD'd on methadone. So some people questioned the conclusion. So I had all these, these questions. Um, but to me, it spoke to the need to, it's really hard to provide really sensitive kinds of care in a jail setting when the jail is breaking down <laughs> and people are in lockdown. And, you know, um, and it really struck me that uh, we are asking our jails to do a lot that they're not designed to do. Um, and that in itself can, um, can put people in danger. Um, but that was one of the hardest things because I also couldn't answer all the questions that are raised for me. Um, yeah, so otherwise, unfortunately, these are iterations on things that I've seen a lot of in my time reporting on death and custody. Well, what I will say is that, you know, your handling of these stories, again, was so masterful in how you brought, you know, the humanness of each individual and, you know, from the perspective of their loved ones and their partners, their people that knew them every day. And I see that that's indicative of your, of your body of work. You know, um, I have the, uh, honor of, of, of going on your personal web page 
and seeing uh, some of the things that you've done for, you know, NBC and for Vice and different things of that nature. And I can see that there's that common thread of really exposing the humanity of uh, the subject matter. And um, what I will say is that that is so important in this day and time, right? When we're working in criminal justice reform, a lot of people want to um, focus on the statistics and, you know, depopulation. And like Dave was saying, a lot of the individuals who are caught up in this system have no business being there in the first place. But it is so important for people like yourself um, who have a platform and have this voice to really bring out the humanness. And I'd like to just mention, you know, for instance, the story that you did in, in Louisiana, actually, Jefferson Parish, the young boy who had gotten shot by the sheriff's deputies and the way that you brought out his side of the story and what his mother was going through, the fact that she had to go to work and just wasn't getting any answers and different things of that nature. So I would love for you to, I mean, juxtapose this with what you did with the Rikers, because this is something that I feel that is always a thread with you, that you really, really seek to bring out the humanity of the of of really the whole story, right? The whole person, like you said before. Well, I think um, over time I've thought a lot about the rippling effects of the system. Um, when when someone touches the whether you call it the criminal justice system or the criminal legal system or a prison or a jail or a court, um, it's usually not one person, um, and we are often focused on that person and not focused on that like sort of stretched out effect. Um, and in both Rikers and that story in Louisiana, you know, women are often my sources. Um, they are often the, the moms and the girlfriends and the sisters and the daughters who are negotiating the system. And needing answers and not getting them or paying bills and to a system that doesn't feel accountable to them um and so i think and i think i've focused over the years a lot about that experience because it's one that has often been overlooked and yet in my decade of reporting i saw that accumulating um which has led to this other project that i will um we kind of dive into. Um, but I think, um, I also think I've learned a lot because the people that I talk to often have very nuanced views. Um, and in the sense of, like they, the women or even the people in the system can see things from many sides. It's often not totally black and white. Um, and I try to bring that out because I don't think someone who's involved in the system, it's not always black and white, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, someone can be, have committed a crime and also be an important person in someone's life. And someone can be a victim of a crime and also uh, have thoughts about the system. <laughs> you right. know? And so I, I try to bring out that nuance because if there, I think everyone agrees that the system doesn't work. Um, there are a lot of people who don't feel safe and there's a lot of people who feel unduly punished. Um, but I think in order to make change, we have to like live in that nuance and that makes things much more complicated. So as a journalist, I feel I'm not an activist. You know, I am a storyteller and stories allow room for some of those gray areas that, that action should be influenced by, but action is a different prospect. Um, and so I, I see myself as like in that space where I can like muddy the waters sometimes <laughs> and hopefully like that's useful. Um, Very useful. Yeah. I did always enjoy the pot stirring part of it. It was, yeah. I, I, think, I think it was the immersion in the pot that made me very uncomfortable and, and burned me out eventually. Yeah. Um, when, when we get in, we'll get, let's get into the story of the film in a second. Yeah. But, but I think one thing that really encapsulates this work well is the Instagram feed. And so I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to give it, I don't, I don't want to give it short shrift. Yeah. Um, the everyday at everyday incarceration on Instagram, mm -hmm. if you haven't powerful, seen it, incredibly, powerful, incredibly powerful, yet again, simple visual representations of 
those ripples mm -hmm. and the life and the work uh, that needs to continue while someone is behind bars and, and also the impacts uh, because of that person's absence. Um, how did it start? What does it do? What has the response been? Give us the whole everyday incarceration okay. uh, uh, story. Yeah. So in twenty four, late 2013, early 2014, uh, I had been reporting on criminal justice for a few years. I am an investigative reporter mostly. And so try and combine that kind of hard hitting pot stirring with human stories. <laughs> Um, and I was talking to a friend of mine, Zara Katz, who's a photo editor and visual producer. And this was a very different moment um, in journalism in terms of coverage of criminal justice issues. And, you know, she was saying, I am visual first and most of my news, I sort of look at the photo and then, and because there's so little photography about incarceration or criminal justice issues, I feel like I've, I don't know those stories is what Zara said. And because, you know, it's very hard to photograph in facilities. Um, it In 2014, it wasn't as widely covered. We didn't have a lot of the news outlets we have today that are focused on criminal justice issues. Um, and so she said, why don't we, st Instagram was still kind of newer. I didn't have an Instagram account at the time. Um, and she said, why don't we start an Instagram feed? I will reach out to all of my photographers um, who have done this work over the years and you can, jimmy the captions and we can start to create an archive of what this actually looked like somewhere to go and see it and we kind of made the window of the era of mass incarceration so sort of 1980 forward and she started reaching out to people who dug into their files and we have stuff i think the earliest is the late 1970s in georgia these kind of amazing black and white images mm. in facility in parts of facilities you just don't would ever get access to now um up until today and we wanted images behind bars but we also wanted to yeah the the idea of every day which is part of an it started as everyday africa and like the idea was to push back against the images of africa that were mm. all sort of one note and there's like an entire continent and a very robust life. And that feed is really big. And so we became part of the sort of everyday family. Um, but we wanted to take their same ethos of what is the quotidian life day-to-day -day experience if you touch this system. Um, and so, yeah, we curated it in sets and tried to tell little stories, um, you know, featuring different photographers. And it really started to take on a life of its own. Um, I mean, so it's been a labor of love. We still, Zara still reaches out to, we have a great intern who helps us out now, Carla Canning, who is into these issues, but we still kind of do it in between things. Um, but as we went forward, I was talking to Zara, who has always had a lot of interest in stories by and about um, women. And I said, you know, the one story that is kind of missing is of all my sources, you know, and what it's like to wait in line to go into a facility and what it's like to wait for the call that you haven't gotten and what it's like to scrap up some money for commissary right. um, and what it's like to not get answers <laughs> or be frustrated at times. And so with some help from the Magnum Foundation, which is a photo foundation, we did a workshop and then got some support from them to start interviewing women and we made a survey and we started kind of talking to women about what is your story? What's the story you would want to tell? Um, and what would it look like to put this as the primary story about incarceration in one context? Like, yes, the person inside, but what if we sort of flipped it and just talked to you first? And, and what would that story look like? Um, and that's how we met Ms. Crystal Bush, who has become a partner and a collaborator and a friend. She um, was running a van service in Philadelphia called Bridging the Gap. And uh, it was a, you know, they would drive folks from Philadelphia to the prisons across the state, as in Louisiana and California, mm -hmm. New York, the prisons are often very far from where people's families are. Exactly. Um, and so the very issue of transportation becomes a barrier to keeping mm -hmm. families together. 
Crystal had had virtually every man in her life incarcerated. Her dad went in when she was three. Um, her brother had spent, by the time we met her, more than a decade in jail. Another brother in and out. Cousins serving really long sentences. Um, and that's not unusual for a lot of people in in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia in particular. Um, they've had pretty harsh, uh, actually very much like Louisiana, you know, second degree is automatic life sentence. So you just have, mm -hmm. you had tons of lifers in, in Pennsylvania and other people serving a lot of time. Um, and we started working with Crystal. She's this incredibly open person, just a couple years younger than we are. And, you know, just a really vibrant, fun, yeah. Um, energetic. She uh, had a full-time job as a social worker and then did this as, it was a business, but, you know, <laughs> not one to make you rich. <laughs> right. Um, and, and she did that on the weekends. Her mom drove as well. And at some point she was just like, you got to come ride the van, you know, like you can ask me all these questions, but like, you should really just ride, ride the van. And so in the summer of 2016, we did, and we worked with her and a number of her riders to create a photo exhibition um, with the photographer Zora Murph, who's really brilliant. And Crystal brought a, a band full of riders to Photoville to come see it. And the women just stood there and they read the interviews of themselves and they watched this video. And we were kind of joking with them because we knew many people pretty well at that point. Like, you do this every weekend, what are you looking at? <laughs> And they said, well, we've never really seen it like this. Right. Yeah, I do it, but to really witness my experience is different. Um, and so, and and actually during that process, like a bunch of, it was a, the exhibit was up for a week and women would come and kind of whisper to us like, oh yeah, I have someone inside or I this is my experience. And, you know, we just, decided to keep going. We never intended to make a documentary, but we went back to Philadelphia and talked to Crystal some more. And the story started to shift because both her brother and her father came home um, about a year after we met her. And that was so joyful and also really complicated. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they had not been a family together. She uh, has been raising her brother's son, her nephew, um, since she was in her early 20s. And all of a sudden, you know, she was a daughter and a caretaker to her father, a sister and a co-parent to her brother. Um, the criminal justice system was looming in the background. And so over the four years that the film covers, it captures the complexity of, of trying to become a family after being torn apart for so long. Um, and really like Crystal is a really opinionated, you know, powerful voice and she voices the love and the frustration and the, mm -hmm. you know, all, all of that in that period. Um, and like I said, it's sort of, it, it, it operates in that complex space that we're interested in, but it is also a really full throated one woman's experience that's not a real experience and we always emphasize that but um yeah like what it is to be this young ambitious woman and also to to try and be connected to family is to always be tethered to the system and what does that take from people so the film is called a woman on the outside and it's going to debut at south by southwest film festival in march Wow, South by that Southwest. That is so exciting. Unbelievable. And uh, thank you for saving that news for the Fair Fight Initiative podcast and <laughs> telling the world. <laughs> I mean, well, how appropriate. <clears throat> I will tell you that, you know, just it is so amazing. This film is um, as as we walk through the system, right, this this mass incarceration and we're dissecting all of these parts and it is it is very wow. refreshing right mm -hmm. to see this perspective because a lot of times like you know like dave said we always want to focus on the mechanics of why and who and what right but not the um 
the overarching uh, uh, um, consequences of what's going on behind the scenes, what the families are going through, right? This is another part, and I think you may have mentioned this in uh, the documentary promo, um, uh, you know, this is another side of an American family, right? We think of American family as one thing, but because mass incarceration is such an integral part of the American experience, especially for my, you know, for African Americans, for black and brown people, that this is the other side of that. You mentioned the women coming up and whispering, oh, I have someone in. It almost says, okay, you're not by yourself. You know, when I looked at the Instagram, the everyday incarceration, I was just thinking to myself how many people were familiar to me and how people need to see this and to be able to see themselves, to be able to grow their perspective. And God kept giving me this analogy of the Good Samaritan, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about that story, for those who don't know it, it's about a man who was robbed and he was beaten and left on the side of the road. And there were a series of people that come by and see him, but they don't want to get involved, right? But then there's this person that comes by, the Good Samaritan that sees him and not only gets him out of that hole, but takes him to a place and provides for him as he is getting, uh, as he is recovering. And what what I felt when I was looking at the work and I was looking at the, the documentary is that you are exposing that person, right? You are exposing that person that is laying there as a whole individual person. And it is up to the individual to decide if they're going to walk away. And it is so important for that exposure to be done, right? Because you can use why they got arrested. You can use where they are now incarcerated and you can use that to look away. Mm. But once you begin to see the person, begin to see their families, the benefit of who they are, their life means something then it's a little bit harder for you to look away. And then now it becomes a personal question. Why am I not doing more to change this scourge? I can't wait to see it. I was absolutely. I'm excited to, to show it to you. Yes, yes. I, um, I want to, so there, there aren't a lot of good studies about women, about how many, but there are a few estimates. And as many as one in four American women may have had either a close loved one or a friend or acquaintance incarcerated. And we talk about that number because there's 1.2, you know, or there's about 2 million people incarcerated now, give or take, you know, um, and on any given day. But when you look at that in the aggregate, but many, many more. And if we're talking about an experience that has touched a quarter of American women in some way, it is a majority experience. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, it's right. At least it's not a, it's not a, it's not a fringe experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think our goal is, in many ways, to get that conversation. I can't tell you how many people, when we talk to them, they're like, "Oh, well, I, you know, I do. I have had people inside." And and I feel like if that were something that were talked about more and not mm -hmm. stigmatized, it would shift the conversation exactly, about yeah. exactly. Um, and if if you would permit me to to build on your good samaritan for a moment um mm -hmm. i think that we ask the women to be the good samaritans mm -hmm. to get someone out of the hole and and there is a lot of that should be honored yes but i also think we should question whether we ha we asked society to, to wait around for someone with a good heart to come right. um, and and what that asks of people, you know, and I think Crystal's experience, and I'm sure your experience, maybe you share it, you know, offline with people of what they'd ask of you to, to be the person who's coming by and not walking by. Exactly. And I think if we actually recognize the, it, it's a form of caregiving in the same way we ask people to mother without recognition, to mm -hmm. to do health care without recognition, to care for elderly people and children without recognition or compensation or support. And I think the demand, the expectation that good hearted people will pick up the burden of the people that we allow to be harmed or um, leave worse off than we, we got them 
when they arrived um, is something that we need to consider um, because that Good Samaritan story, um, you know, it, it takes a lot out of you to be a Good Samaritan. You can get yeah. something, but it often can leave you depleted. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to ask, like, not only how can we support the people who are lying on the road, but how can we support the people who pick them up? That's an amazing yeah. point. I, I think there's a wrongness about the expectation of who is expected to do it like, that you that you point out, too, that, that, we, right. that, that we need to focus on. Because a person who looks like me is excused from being a good Samaritan if he's too busy uh, with his work uh, or to mm -hmm. be a father. Um, if, if it's a gender thing, if it's a race thing, um, it's, you know, there are different excuses, uh, that allow for a person who looks like me not to be a Samaritan. Uh, mm -hmm. however, it's entirely unfair for our women and for our people of color to just be entirely expected to always be the Samaritan or always expect to offer the grace, um, when, right. when something bad happens to them, when, when something bad happens to a person that looks like me, I'm allowed to be outraged. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that in the context of the means by which you're telling these stories, because I was incredibly moved to hear you account for the women entering a, a gallery to see their story. Mm -hmm. And the, the primary power of this, of course, is what Linda has already touched on. And I, I don't want this to, to sound like some one up or, or, or trumping that. I think that, that that is the primary experience of this, that everyone should and can see that will start to lower the walls of those jails and allow us more sight into the impacts that this system is having on all of us. But the means by which you are presenting those stories, whether it's in a photo gallery or now at South by Southwest, um, the impact that it's had on them to have their stories accepted in, in channels that are typically only reserved for stories that, 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 um, that don't look like theirs or that don't involve outcomes like theirs or, uh, that are, like Linda said, typically whispered because it's shameful. Um, the impact that it's had on the people uh, since the gallery or what you expect uh, on the red carpet at South by Southwest, the impact for it to have for these stories to come into, I hate to call it popular consciousness because I take issue with what makes it popular, but sure. the mainstream. Well, you know, I worry about that. And Linda, maybe you could speak to this because you've been attention can go in many directions and we are very close to this family the the film captures some really hard moments that we did not see coming um and so we went down a couple weekends ago and showed it to everyone in the family and talked about it and we said you know how can we support you like it's gonna Beautiful. be weird to have people in your life and ask you questions about these you know how are you going to figure out how to talk about it um you know, what's this going to mean in your family? You're going to be a little bit more of a public figure. How do you feel about that? You know, and so um, I think we, we're hope we're trying to figure out how to prepare for some of that because it's it's strange. Even doing this is strange for me. Um, you know, it's one thing to have my name on a on a website. It's another thing to have my face and speaking and, you know, <laughs> thinking in public. Um, so I think, I think we're going to figure that out, but I hope that, um, it, it, it puts it in the canon in the sense of this being a, we, I think of this as a story about American family and a story about families and a story about the complexities of families and what people go through behind closed doors. Um, or, you know, what goes on at home with the woman who might be teaching your child or caring for your loved one or running a boardroom or, you know, driving a bus. <laughs> it, it, right. it can be any of those people. Um, but I, I think that um, I it's an incredible honor to have people be willing to answer your questions and share their stories. And this family has been so open and opened their doors and their lives in a way that um, is very rare, I think. And we tried to honor that as best we could and, and understand what the limits of that should be. 
Um, and I think that could be very complicated. So I am hoping that it's in my, I hope that people receive this as that story and think about it and either see themselves in it, even if their experience is very different, maybe in their relationship with their brother or their mother or their child or their dad. Um, and, you know, and I also feel somewhat protective because what it is to, and Linda, you know this, to lay out these really sensitive parts of your life. And, you know, there's going to be some people who don't care. And mm -hmm. that's part of the deal. Um, there's going to be some people who judge and that's part of the deal. And so I think we're going to figure out what that means um, and figure it out together. But, you know, with any story, you put it out into the world and it's not yours in the same way anymore. Yeah, I, I just my heart is leaping here when you said that you went, you took the time to go back and yeah. to be with the family and to show them these things and to get their reactions and not exploit that you may have had a, you know, a good uh, take of a, a of a um, one of those, you know, housewifey type of moments. You know what I mean? The drama of the situation. And I will tell you from experience that that is paramount for those of us who will open up our wounds to you that you take into consideration what we may be going through because you know as much as you feel this is new to you having to do your interviews and this is a nightmare that we never wanted to live we don't want this recognition for this yeah. reason and to have someone who is so caring not only with our stories, but with how that story is going to be affecting us in everyday time. You are right dead on and bravo to you and your crew. And it shows that the story itself and the people really mean something to you and not just putting it out there for the sake of, oh my goodness, we've got this good angle. Let's run with it, right? Because they're going to need that support. And I'm telling you from personal experience, they're going to need to know how to navigate the media. They're going to need yeah. to know what to say and when to say. And they're going to, I know I felt uncomfortable. You feel, um, you know, like you don't want to say the wrong thing, but then you want, you want to be yourself, but you can't be yourself. And so you um, just saying that shows that they're, and, and this young lady is so amazing in all that she is already doing. Um, and sometimes we can come across extremely confident and, and extremely adept in certain situations. But on the inside, we're very insecure because we do hold the weight of our families on our shoulders. And um, so it's a blessing to know that you are really concerned about that and stay in that vein. You know, even, you know, what, however much help and encouragement you can give, you know, do that. And I think that you're doing that and that's going to show. Yeah. And I'll just say, you know, it's myself, my co-director, Zara Katz, our incredible producer, Kira C. Jones, who is also a writer on the project and kind of the, the North Star in many ways, and our editor, Susanna Herbert. And, you know, as white directors, we've thought a lot. We've talked a lot with the family. There is a lot of complex history and politics there that is really important for us to navigate. And Kira's a Black woman. And... You know, we had really a lot of conversations about these questions and access and what we show and how that's framed within the history of media right. and the pain of Black women and, you know, not wanting it to be just about that because someone right. is a whole person. Um, and, you know, Susanna is an incredibly sensitive editor and we had that group of women. We're like, okay, how do we tell a story that resonates? With women and how do we care for each other and for those women as we move forward and mm -hmm. what are the unexpected so dave to your question i i hope people see pieces of their own experience of the, of the experience of the women that they know in this and not simply as sort of an othered experience because mm -hmm. i think i think it's really a shared one whether it's criminal justice specifically or the experience of women navigating the world. Um, and this is one iteration of that. It's empowering. What you have done 
is empowering. What Dave, what you guys do when you're telling stories and it's done in such a brilliant and amazing way. And I'm speaking about journalists and people who tell these storytellers is that you give us an opportunity to feel that our, our voices matter. And you have empowered that family. I will tell you that. And so just the love and the ease with which you're telling me that you're interacting lets me know that you are a um, you're an ally and you have empowered. You are this is empowering because that's what you feel when you see your story. I guarantee you when those ladies walked in there and they saw, you know, videos of them speaking and somebody is listening to me and that validates you and that gives you power. It makes you feel more powerful. Again, thank you so much, Lisa, uh, for your perspective. Thank you so much for the way that you care and um, about the stories, about the subject, about the people um, that you uh, allow to be seen through your uh, platform 